known far and wide as miracle comebacks, ones that have helped establish Oklahoma football as a traditional powerhouse. Barry Switzer, of course, is a Hall of Fame coach who won a Super Bowl and three national championships. He says the two biggest plays of his career came in the 1975 OU Missouri game, the game where Sooner Magic was born. And that 75 season, you know, things just never clicked. That play in my career, those two plays back to back, the touchdown, the two point play, was the biggest plays because it won a national championship. All right, this is our series done in conjunction with Sooner Magic DVD, two hour special there. You can learn more about it, pick it up actually, SoonerMagicDVD.com. Joe Washington. Pretty nice player. Oh, God. I'm sweating over here. I, I love those interviews, too. Because of Columbus, Ohio, because of the drama, it might have been the most special moment in OU football history. It really might have. And you've just seen our exclusive edited version of one of the games you can find on Sooner Magic DVD. This is the complete documentary, SoonerMagicDVD.com. You know, it got very quiet there. I don't know if it got quite as quiet as Billy Sims described. <laughs> right, I, I got to ask you: Was it uh, was that is that your most magical moment ever in sports? Uh, sure. Because I mean, you, sure. You know, that was old number yeah. two out yeah. there. That yeah. was, um, you know, that's one that's been voted uh, that big, and yeah. uh, I had that much to do with it. But it was just great being there. You look good out there. Well, I had a good seat for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good, a good spot. Yeah, You're you a little more limber back then. <laughs> Faster too. I know. Faster, yeah. Good great stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah, great, great stuff. I remember the phrase being attributed to the comebacks that we had back in the in the 70s. To me, uh, it, it, it speaks back to probably um, mostly to, to Coach Switzer and, and their come from behind victories is kind of how I look at it. When you really look into you know what Sooner Magic is all about, really you have to look at everything going back to Barry Switzer. It just no ifs, ands, and buts about it. When we came back from Nebraska being down in the fourth quarter six times and winning the game in a close game in the fourth quarter against the University of Nebraska, that was Sooner Magic. Games where Oklahoma pulled one out at the end and, and you know, in the last 30 seconds, last minute or two minutes, they did something fairly spectacular. And, and, uh, and of course, part of that was due to the fact that they had great athletes and great coaches. Well, it's, I think it's just part of the Sooner tradition. It's just something that's been woven into the fabric of what we've come to know and love. When I think of Sooner magic, I think of the 1970s and really the Nebraska series. That's where I think Sooner magic was born. Uh, basically, Sooner magic to me means that it's never over until it's over. A lot of the Sooner magic has to do with um, the guys. It's the guys that have played before. I mean, the guys that pass it on. You have to pass that on. It's that faith, it's that belief that something's going to happen, something great is going to happen. The sooner magic to me is just when, you know, the football gods look down upon you and shine, but we have a little bit specialer one than everybody else because <laughs> we're Sooners. Sooner magic seems to happen when you have great players and great coaches and great moments. It's a belief um, by not just the team that's playing on the field, by everybody involved, everybody watching, everybody that has paid their ticket, um, that we can get it done. Special moments, big plays, just momentum change and, at OU football. I mean, it's nothing like it. It began in 1975 or perhaps 1976, and then it ran through about 1988 and then it didn't resurface until about 2000. But I think during that particular time, they threw the hat out. Or better yet, they threw it in the closet, they let it get dust on it. No, they didn't do that. This is what they did to the hat. They took the hat, they still set it out where everybody could see it, but they covered it up so nobody would know what it was. And I think when they did that, during those particular you know, times, that's when you know, people lost sight of what Sooner Magic is all about. When Bob Stoops came back in the 2000 season, when no one gave Oklahoma a chance to, to win a championship, uh, the game at the game, what they did, it, it, and, and Bob knew all about Sooner Magic coming in, and he just, uh, it's, it's like 
Barry Switzer said Bud Wilkinson created the monster, I just feed it. Well, Barry Switzer, in part, he was the one who defines it, the magic created it, and Bob Soup just feeds it. Well, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna see a lot more magic in the future. Well, I, I hope Joe Washington is correct in that, that there is a box and we found it, uh, because I appreciate that. Uh, you know, uh, you know, great coaches, uh, Coach Switzer and the, and the group of great players that he had uh, created a lot of magic, and, and uh, hopefully we're doing that. Uh, we are, in, in, in a sense, and, uh, you know, so hopefully Joe's right. Uh, we'll keep that box uh, open and, and keep sprinkling all the magic we can take. And I'll promise you, I'll take all I can get. So, uh, you know, so anyway, hopefully that's the case. Appreciate it, Joe. Uh, again, uh, we're going we're gonna to keep that box open, hopefully. And that's the secret to the Sooner Magic. The Red Sox, curse of the Bambino. Notre Dame's luck of the Irish. Terms used to rationalize why games that should have been won were lost, and those that should have been lost were won. The idea that the game is not only decided on the field, but the outcome is also determined by something indescribable and more mysterious. For football fans in Norman, Oklahoma, Sooner Magic is synonymous with Sooner football itself. It's as much a part of the school's tradition as the fight song or the Sooner Schooner. Oklahoma football has a rich history and tradition. It also has a legacy of winning the unwinnable. This is a historical look at the Oklahoma Sooners, a team that turned losses into wins and wins into legend. The phrase Sooner Magic was officially coined in the 1970s, but in Norman, Oklahoma, pixie dust was in the air as far back as 1950, as the Aggies of Texas A&M found out firsthand. People wonder about the stadium size and the crowds. It was never a sellout during Bud's reign until the Notre Dame game of 57. The 50 team was really kind of a rebuilding year. We'd lost a lot of our really great linemen in the 49 team, so, uh, we were trying to keep that streak going. I was sitting in the north end zone in the Texas A&MOU game in 1950. Claude Arnold, as it would happen, uh, was uh, going with a woman who lived next door to me all my life. I call her my almost sister. And, and so I knew Claude well. And Claude never got to play as much as he thought because he was a passer and Bud stuck with the old split tee and a lot of running. Well, we've been talking about Sooner Magic. And the day, that day, that particular day, the Sooner Magic was in Claude Arnold's right arm. Well, they had a big end that played for them, Texas A&M did, named Andy Hillhouse. I'll never forget it because he was my responsibility. And uh, we kind of had a battle going on all day. And when they went ahead, he said, hey, Gray, what do you think about that? And then after we scored, I followed him to his bench and said, Andy, talk to me. <laughs> That's the only thing. I've never heard that story. Yeah, I think there was a little over three minutes to go, and Texas A&M had scored, and uh, had gone ahead 28 to 21. The game had gone back and forth the whole game. The Sooners were about to tie the game after future Heisman Trophy winner Billy Vessels caught a touchdown pass from Claude Arnold. We got the ball back and uh, I don't remember exactly what yard line we were on, but I, I did throw a ball to Billy and he made a, a good run and, uh, and scored the touchdown that we thought was gonna tie it up. And, uh, we missed the extra point. Leaving the Sooners one point down with 3.36 left in the game. Texas A&M were unable to move the ball as the tough Sooner defense forced the Aggies to punt with just 1.46 to go. We were just sweating that we could hold them without them making a first down. No one ever thought we were gonna lose because we hadn't lost any. But 
but we got the ball back with about, I don't know, 70 yards to go. I think it was a little over a minute to play. Well, Claude led the centers, as you know, on an incredible drive down the field, passing the ball in the final few minutes of the game. Our passing offense was limited. We had one good thing going for us, and it was Claude. Play action passes don't work too well with a minute to go and 70 yards to go, but uh, we somehow did it. Arnold led the Sooners on a 69-yard drive, and with just 37 seconds left, Oklahoma was four yards away from a miraculous comeback. We didn't even think about kicking a field goal, which we were only behind one point, and you know, in these days, that's what you would be trying to do, get in position for a field goal. And we just didn't kick field goals in those days. And uh, I don't know whether, I, I don't think hardly anybody kicked field goals, but I, you know, we just, we didn't have a, uh, we didn't recruit a, a field goal kicker. We just, uh, whoever, whoever uh, kicked extra points the best off of the guys that were actually playing was who got the job. Fullback Leon Heath rumbled in for the score and gave the Sooners a hard fought and unbelievable victory. The Aggies' defeat gave the Sooners their 23rd win in a row, and a most important victory it turned out to be. I looked up in the stands, and I was on my back, and looked up in the stands, and they were throwing cushions, anything they could get their hands on, and I mean it was no one had left, and they stayed after the game forever seemed like. They just sat there for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was really eerie. OU would go on to win its first ever national championship and Sooner Magic was born. Legendary coach Bud Wilkinson no doubt used some of that magic in the years that followed, leading the Sooners to back-to-back -to -back national titles in 1955 and 1956, while amassing an outstanding 47-game win streak. The streak, spanning from 1953 to 1957, still stands today. People still come up to me and talk to me about that game. They have to be old to do that, but... But I still, <laughs> I still hear a lot of people talking about having been there. Yeah, to this day, that has to be one of the most exciting games I have ever seen, either, either as a broadcaster or a fan. We pulled out three or four games that year. I guess it was Sooner Magic. Yeah, it was Sooner Magic. And yeah. they didn't even know what it was. Yeah. After winning a national championship in only his second season, head coach Barry Switzer had his team on track to repeat. And that 75 season, you know, things just never clicked. Uh, OU ended up winning the national championship, but they weren't as good as a lot of Barry Switzer's teams. Well, well people forget about that game because Oklahoma had been beaten by uh, Kansas earlier that year, so they lose to Missouri, there's no chance of winning a national championship. And it's my feeling that as, as we discuss the, the games where Sooner Magic is a participant, and the first time that, that all of us can agree that it surfaced was, was at Columbia, Missouri. Uh, in 1975. You know, this is a program that was not used to losing. You know, 73, there, there weren't any losses. In 74, undefeated, you go win a national championship. 75, the heavy favorite to repeat, and then just stunned by Kansas the week before. I did not know how we would play in Missouri. I was concerned about our psychological uh, game. When you talk about the 75 game against Missouri, I think what is really tough about going into this game is first of all is right after a loss to, to Kansas. Of all people, Kansas. I knew we would be physically and mentally prepared, mentally prepared for our game plan, uh, physically ready to play, but emotionally I didn't know what, what we would be. I think that was probably one of the few times I wasn't really in a very good mood or emotionally, you know, just tired, drained, you know, beat up a little bit, a lot of injuries. So I really didn't know what to expect until the football game started. What's interesting is this game was not broadcast on television so that literally millions of Oklahoma fans were glued to their radios. It's hard for people under the age of 35 probably to even fathom what it's like to, to really listen to a big game on the radio. 
These teams in this era at Missouri were much better than what people like to think uh, Missouri has been the past several decades or the past decade. And, uh, Missouri was a very good football team. We went up and jumped out 20 to nothing. So I said, hey, this is where things are going great. You know, and against a good Missouri team. We started off and we scored uh, first three touchdowns. Hey, okay, we're feeling pretty good here. And uh, it all disintegrates in the second half again at Missouri. We uh, some way just lost it at the halftime. We started to uh, disintegrate and and all of a sudden Missouri is back in the hunt. One thing I think that contributes to Sooner Magic is that when it occurs there has been some dramatic reversal of fortune and this was an example where I think everyone's hearts were in their throats. It appeared that not only was OU going to lose, but they had a lot to lose. They had a conference championship and a shot at the national title on the line. When they got in the lead, I really thought it was just a matter of us basically getting a chance to move the football. When you have Joe Washington, nothing's over. You know, there, there wasn't any need for much sooner magic prior to that game because we were ahead in every game. We got the ball, our defense finally stopped them, they punted us deep, all of a sudden we're faced with a fourth and two. And they're 72 yards away, we call timeout. We're in the huddle, Steve's in the sideline, and all I'm thinking now is that I want the ball. I'm, I will never say it or anything, but this is what I, I'm really thinking this. Steve Davis, our quarterback, comes to the sidelines, I'm on the headset on the sideline talking to Galen Hall, our offensive coordinator in the press box. And this is uh, all or nothing here. And the Sooners go for it, you know, in, in retrospect, that was a, you know, Bob Stoops might do that, but not too many coaches then or now is gonna go for it on fourth and one. I was at, at the particular point that uh, I knew I wanted to bowl in this particular instance. I see Steve Davis uh, turn and look at me and I said, Steve, make sure little Joe has the ball. And he smiles and, and he gives me the signal, you got it coach. Steve came in, he called the play, and uh, the first the one thing he said, little Joe makes you busy. Little Joe be ready, I goes, I am pitching. And when he said he was pitching it, hey, I, I, that was the most, I felt very, very calm at that particular point. We go out and we run a predetermined option play with a different blocking scheme on the corner. I remember Victor Hicks, our tight end, releasing from the corner. He gets off the line parallel, gets great position on the corner. Uh, we don't have anyone for the safety because the fullback can't get through to him, but Joe has to make that guy missing. If he does, we're going to make a big play. And, uh, you know, you know when you know when the play starts and you're just sitting there waiting, wanting to jump through the radio, what's going to happen? Davis takes the snap from center. When the uh, ball snapped, I took off and Steve didn't waste any time pitching the ball to me. Keeps the ball, pitches it to Washington. Washington cuts to the 30, 35, to the 40. And all of a sudden, he pops on over the field and uh, it's a foot race. 30, 35, to the 40. Go, Joe, 45, to the Almost as if, you know, the path was was laid out. Washington has just run 75 yards for a touchdown. The crowd is, of course, stunned, except for the Sooner fans who are cheering uh, and singing Boomer Sooner. There was nothing like watching little Joe Washington run. Uh, the, the closest thing I can compare it to is watching Muhammad Ali box. You know, I talked to Joe not long ago, and he talked about that play, and he basically said, you know, I made a lot better plays than that. He said, the guys blocked so well for me on that play, I didn't have to do much. All I did on that particular play is I made two quick cuts, and it just seemed as if a path had been laid out. The big play was the next one. And a lot of people forget the next, they had to have a two-point conversion to win the game. A tie, they're not going to win the national championship. We're still short an extra point. We can't play for a tie. We have to play for the win because we're going to play undefeated Nebraska the next week in Lincoln, hopefully for the Big 8 championship and on to the Orange Bowl to win the national championship. I don't think we ever thought about going for one. I think it was a matter of how are we going to get to. So again, we call timeout in a situation you don't normally call timeout. It's a two-point play. We were on pins and needles to see what would happen. Well, obviously, uh, my decision is to make sure Joe Washington handles the ball again. 
Same play, option right, and pitch it to Joe, and uh, the blocking wasn't as great on the option play. On the option, pitches it back to Joe Washington. Joe Washington has the two points. Goes across the goal line, airborne, and puts the ball over the goal line. Good many people in black and gold will still tell you that uh, Joe still hadn't reached the goal line. I want to set that straight for the record. Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder, Jose Feliciano, Ronnie Millsap, and anybody who's asleep would have said he was in. But uh, the referee put his arms up. And uh, they signaled 28 uh, to 27 game. And, and you can just imagine how many car wrecks there were when Washington went into the end zone for the two-point conversion. All of a sudden, hope returned. And of course, they went on to win the national championship, wax Nebraska the next week, and uh, beat Michigan in the Orange Bowl. When we were playing that particular game, I, I'm not sure who Nebraska was playing. But Nebraska heard the score, even though they, you know, the score was announced that Missouri was winning, for some reason, they didn't get all juiced about it because they understood the mystique of Oklahoma and what we were capable of doing. When you look back on that play, that play in my career, those two plays back to back, the touchdown, the two point play were the biggest plays because it won a national championship. Rivalries. They symbolize the power, the emotion, and the history of sports. One of the best rivalries is without a doubt Oklahoma and Nebraska. This rivalry had its share of unbelievable moments and no shortage of Sooner Magic. I think that we'll, what we find is that the great bulk of the Sooner Magic events happen in OU Nebraska games. And for whatever reason, more often than not, they happen in Lincoln. If there was any school that I think over the years was burned by student magic it was Nebraska. I always ask a leader, senior leader, to lead us in a prayer before we go out on the field. Just a few lines that will endure forever in OU football lore. And, and Scott Hill's prayer in the, in the locker room before the game is, is, is one of those lines that will endure forever. He said all the right things that you do say in a prayer and all of a sudden he gets down to uh, the, the amen, and right before he says the amen, he says, and dear Lord, please don't let the best team win the day. I, I don't know what it did to those guys, but I gotta believe it put them at ease, and I gotta believe it just cracked them up and made them go out there and say, you know what, we're playing a football game, let's just go play. So when we take the field at Lincoln, we're all dying laughing. We come out of the locker room in front of their student section, our guys are just dying, laughing. I mean, it's, it, I'm sure the, the fans in Nebraska are wondering what in the world's going on. Why are we reacting the way we are? And uh, Oklahoma's out there being goofy, throwing you know all kind of end around passes, just just going nutty out there. Just it's something you never see in a game. There's Nebraska all regimented, not talking. Anybody plays, and they're usually out there having fun, putting on the show. I guess it to kind of relax us, and we were going out and. Uh, and uh, go for broke. And it somehow exudes Sooner Magic in that on the one hand this is deadly serious business but on the other there's a lightness to it. And they were supposed to win and say let's go tee it up and, and play the game and uh, that's what we did. And I think it's one of the two best examples of, of Sooner Magic. It was not a great Oklahoma team. We had gotten off to a, a 4 0 start, and I had gotten hurt a couple of days before Texas and couldn't play in that game. There's a little bit of rebuilding at the national championship. We had injuries, and people wouldn't think, oh, he's going to win that game. We did not have a championship caliber team, a national championship caliber team, but we still had a lot of pride. And this is the program that had won the Big Eight in 72, 3, 4, and 5, of course, winning national championships. All those guys that made up the nucleus of our national championship run in 74 and 75 weren't here. So this was a young football team. Nebraska was the better football team. But Barry Switzer and I uh, generally had a, a healthy mutual regard, good friends, and uh, we certainly uh, wanted to win when the, when the day came. And I remember that it was just a typical frigid, cold day in Lincoln. It was, you know, we, we had fallen behind. And it was a tough ball game. Their defense dominated. They totally controlled the game. I don't know how many first downs we made. It wasn't very much. It wasn't pretty. It was ugly. Yeah, that was one of those just uh, 
you know, push, uh, push and shove games where you couldn't get a good feel for the game. And, and it came down to the end of the game, Nebraska leading, and they punted the ball away, kicked the ball away well enough that we had to go the length of the field to win the ball game if we're going to win it. And I know Nebraska had to feel good about them pinning us back and where we were field position wise and how we performed all day. There's no reason for them to worry about us taking the ball the length of the field, first of all. Now you got to remember, this wasn't a Sooner Magic mentality because we were always ahead. You know, for those previous four years, two years, we were always ahead. So it wasn't any of this Sooner Magic. It hadn't started yet. There was only a minute to go in the game. But lo and behold, we do two things that are still boggle my mind today. You know, fairly late in the game and down 10 deep in, the, in their own territory, but they run the halfback pass. We had one halfback that hadn't been in the game all day long, was the best passer of our, and had the strongest arm. And then all of a sudden, with a minute to go, or less than a minute to go in the game, we yell, Woody, Woody Shepard. Of course, he's stunned, he looks at us, and he realizes that, grabs his headgear, and he comes to us, and of course, we're going to call the halfback pass. So with Woody Shepard, who was big time recruit out of Odessa, Texas. Steve runs uh, the deep post off uh, the sweep after faking a stock bot uh, on the corner, in a three deep corner. So we catch him in a three deep, and uh, we pitch the ball on the uh, sweep to the right. And we block it and string it out and let Woody take the ball outside. And all of a sudden, Woody pulls up and lofts a deep ball downfield. And I'm thinking it's a desperation. You know, fourth and 19, a wishbone team. How many times is a wishbone team going to convert fourth and 19? Not very often. And sure enough, the ball is thrown perfectly. And Steve Rhodes, it surprises Nebraska. And Steve Rhodes makes the adjustment to come back and catch the ball cleanly in midfield. Rhodes made the catch, and you think, hey, there's hope. Gets out to about midfield. And nothing develops. And so all of a sudden, it's third and 20, and it's into the wind, and it's misting. And then the all-time great play, one of the all-time great plays, is the, uh, the hook and lateral. Elvis Peacock switches from right halfback to left halfback. They call my number. I go out. And I say, guys, you're not going to believe me, but I think this play is going to work. So let's don't jump off sides. Let's, let's don't have a penalty. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to run the hook and lateral. And Elvis is going to be the one that gets the ball pitched to him if we're successful on the play from our receiver catching the ball and then flipping it back to our fastest back. Dean Levins looked like Johnny Unitas. And Dean comes off the option fake, plants his feet, and throws a quick dart. You look up. You fire it to Rhodes, and it actually hit him where it should have. Threw it to Rhodes, I think, caught it again, and the time is perfect. He catches the ball, as soon as he catches the ball, he flips the ball out. And lateral it to Peacock coming out of the backfield, and he went down the sideline right in front of me. And he zips down the sideline, and uh, all of a sudden you think, hey, uh, and you could see, you could just see the uh, the air, the balloon burst in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, as, as the Husker fans thought. We had him down. You know, 30 seconds ago, they're on their own 15, and now they're on the goal line. It was a thing of beauty. That, that was the beginning then when Barry Switzer just started to own uh, Tom Osborne. And so when OU goes in there and pulls off the unexpected, it is indeed Sooner Magic. Nebraskans obviously focused on that game, and you could win uh, 10 games, and if you didn't win that one, it was like you didn't have a very good year. I think that game was the game that to find Nebraska fans getting a little nervous about beating Oklahoma in the final minutes. What could happen to them? And it was all bad. So that started to soon imagine, but it's kind of us making a few plays and when we had to with some special players. And I think they probably did give birth to the real Sooner Magic that day. There was a lot of ballyhoo and build up for this game. Uh, Woody Hayes, uh, the great uh, coach of the uh, Buckeyes, been there for years, had a great record in college football. And of course it was in the famous Ohio Stadium, the horseshoe, the big horseshoe. And um, it was a, it was a, a, an incredibly intimidating place to play. We go into the stadium, it's one of the big old Coliseum with 80 to 90,000 people. And, uh, it was quite amazing because 
they figured that, you know, Ohio State was more powerful than we were. There was more buildup for that game other than the, the, uh, the 71 uh, game of the century among OU fans. They hadn't played uh, Ohio State. Woody Hayes was this icon, this unbelievable figure that was a little bit loony. The coaches back then, as big as they are now, I think they were bigger back then because of two things. One is they were just as big and just as uh, oh, iconic, but they also were a little bit mysterious. Uh, you didn't get to see Bo Schembechler or Woody Hayes or John McKay every week. When you did get to see them, it was a special event. It was a big because back in those days, you only had one nationally televised uh, game back in those days, so that was the game. We go to Columbus and uh, I'm feeling real good about the game because I knew that this is the first time they had ever played against a wishbone team. And I knew there was no way possible that they could get prepared for our wishbone, who I felt like at that time was probably the best that ever run the offense. Thomas was such a great wishbone quarterback. I mean, he probably wouldn't have been a quarterback in many other schemes, but in a wishbone sense, I mean, he was maybe the greatest wishbone quarterback ever. Well, we start the first quarter and uh, we were playing like we thought we were. Well, it looked like we were gonna just run all over him. We were just thinking of putting a half a hundred on him. <laughs> that was our motto in the back door in those days. I knew that if we, we could jump on them very early, that I could possibly get out of the game as soon as possible. It was just uh, probably one of the most physical games that I ever played in. We had great talent on both sides of the ball. We scored two touchdowns and I kicked two field goals and, and so 20 to nothing, we thought we you know, had it won. We get off to such a perfect start. Oh yeah, I, th I, think, it's a, I think it's a blowout. I, I, I definitely think it's a blowout. Billy Sims twists his ankle and he leaves the ball game. Yeah, I got hurt uh, probably in the second quarter and I uh, had injured my Achilles. Well, first thought is, you know, here's, here's one of our great running backs that was having a great game already. It was going to have a huge game, uh, and he's down and he, you know, he's injured. So that's got a little bit of a, uh, obviously, we're disappointed and, and concerned for his injury and hoping that he could come back, but that wasn't the case. Then Thomas on a run, ducking up for a five or six yard, when he pulls his hamstring, re-injures it. When it happened, um, it was pretty painful at the time. OU was going to blow them out of the game until Thomas Locke gets hurt, until Billy Sims gets hurt, Kenny King. Uh, OU, OU just kicks them if they don't have the injuries, but they had the injuries. But then not only Thomas goes down, but Billy goes down, and they get a comeback going. And then offensively, we, were, you know, we stuck up the place for a while. We started struggling offensively, and we turned the ball over. And Everything turned to disaster. All of a sudden, it's kind of a snowball effect. Ohio State clearly, the fans, the coaches, Woody Hayes, uh, believe they had this game won. The crowd was absolutely nuts. They, they sensed blood. All of a sudden, the momentum was all Ohio State. They had a great team, and this, the, just that stadium is beautiful, and it's, it's loud. and. Uh, so it's a game that they had uh, taken control of. It came down to the end of the ball game again, us having to make plays to get back in the ball game to win it. From Reggie Kinlaw recovering the fumble. We got a turnover, and I remember getting in the huddle, and I remember saying, guys, we have a, a, we're in a position here to where I think we're gonna win this game. And I remember them looking at me and saying, you have got to be crazy. Sooners trail by eight late, uh, score a touchdown, go for two, and miss it, and everybody just, oh, you know, thinks the uh, world's come to an end. On um, the two-point play, I remember getting it to Elvis probably a little bit sooner than I should have, so we were still trailing. Well, if Oklahoma makes that two-point conversion, they're not kicking a, an onside kick. They're kicking off and going to settle for a tie. Everybody goes home 28-28. Well, I knew immediately that the uh, onside kick was our next play. We had a, a team of believers. The Sooner Magic had already taken hold on that football team and that mentality. When Uwe von Schaumann kicked off, it was just fate. Oh, we're just, everybody's jumping up and down because this was our opportunity. So I was just trying to concentrate on, on that play, uh, making sure that I hit a good ball and, uh, and hopefully that we could recover. Dean Blevins hitting a couple of passes to Steve Rhodes, a couple of plays, and then uh, Uwe Von Schaumann coming on to kick a, a field goal. 
So I had no problem where we were on the field, and let's go take this shot at it. That was the glory days of kicker, of kickers. Texas had Russell Erksleben. A&M had uh, Tony Franklin. Arkansas had Steve Little. These guys were guys who kicked 60-yard field goals in their sleep, and Von Schaumann was their peer. I mean, just a fabulous kicker. Uh, to me, it was like an extra point. And I don't remember doing this, but one of our offensive linemen uh, told me that I actually came into the huddle. I went in the huddle and shook his hand, and I told Sammy, don't worry about it, I got it. When it came time to, uh, you know, kick the field goal, of course, Woody Hayes calls timeout. Try to, you know, put a little nervousness on his side. Obviously, they're trying to ice him by calling timeout. They had three timeouts left, and they were calling timeout. Every time we were ready for the kick, they would call another timeout. I, I normally don't hear the crowd. Uh, but at this instant, all the Ohio State fans, they yell, block that kick. And I don't know why I did it, but just spontaneously, I raised my arms and I, you know, I led the chant, block that kick. You know, kickers are crazy anyway, and, and he definitely uh, uh, didn't uh, let us down. I mean, here we go, you got 80-some thousand fans at Ohio State shouting, block that kick. And, and my shaman goes in the middle of the field like he's directing an orchestra or something. And it was kind of humorous on the sidelines. All of a sudden, Uwe would be meditating down on his knees for a few seconds as the rest of the team was huddled up near the ball and him standing back in the middle of the field waiting for his opportunity to kick. And he'd be back up leading the crowd and the champ. I knew then there was no way he was going to miss it. I'm like, man, he's crazy, don't do that. That We all thought that the little German had gone crazy. The mad German is, is Coach Switzer, but the little mad German is Uwe. And, and of course, uh, Bud Hebert took the snap, placed the ball. Coach Switzer was down on his knees. He had his head down in the turf, bent over. You know, I think America was sitting there thinking, hey, wonder if he's gonna make it. And, uh, you know, I think most Oklahoma fans sitting there thinking, he's gonna make this. When I hit it, I knew I hit it well. After Uwe kicked the ball, it was like in slow motion. You could hear a rat peeing on cotton. There's the ball, it's down, the kick is up. It's away, it's long enough. It's long enough, it's good, Oklahoma wins it! In a minute, as soon as I looked up, I think my holder was already jumping up and down. He knew it was already good because my head was still down. So next thing I know is, you know, he's running towards me and he jumps in my arms. And next thing I know, I'm underneath a, a pile of players. In fact, Carl Ballisrod, one of our offensive linemen, actually was on top of me bracing everybody. Otherwise, uh, you know, I would have been crushed right there in, in uh, Columbus. Nuva, I had all confidence in the world was going to hit this field goal, being a 41-yard field goal. That's a chip shot for Uva. So it got so quiet in that stadium. The place was just silent, just totally silent. When that ball is kicked, it's suspended in midair, and all of a sudden, when people see that that baby's going through, there was nothing. I think the Ohio State people were just stunned. I remember after the game, the Ohio State fans were just down and out. I'm in a bar. They put the Woody Hayes show on, and uh, Woody did not talk one sentence about the game. It was the only game I have ever attended in my life where the opposing fans cried after the game. I, I'm talking about dozens of fans. I saw, I saw grown men cry at that football game. And uh, it was, it, I'd never seen such a thing. And I'm walking across the field to see Woody and his pandemonium. It's chaotic, and I finally find Woody in the crowd looking for me. And I remember our, our trainer being in front of me, and I can't remember which trainer was, sticking his hand out uh, five yards in front of me to shake hands with Woody. And I remember Woody just taking his hand and backhanding our little trainer, knocking him away. You know what, he was going to cold cock him, and uh, Woody was the happiest person. And I'm thinking, well, maybe he's going to do that to me. So I just veer off to the left and head for the locker room as Woody is looking for me in the crowd. So I never know to the day whether Woody was going to lambast me or shake my hand. But I think Woody was shaking my hand. And I looked to guys on the sideline and said, hey, it's time to go. <laughs> so we run it off the field. Because, <laughs> boy, that was a great, great kick and a great game, I tell you. OU's never had a kicker like Uwe von Schaumann and uh, may never have one again. I think that play, people probably remember more of von Schaumann kicking the field goal and winning the game than any of maybe play in OU history. Nobody could have predicted the ultimate outcome, and there again, that is one of the ingredients of Sooner Magic. And just everything that followed defined uh, what, again, Sooner Magic was all about. And I bet if you, 
if you uh, quizzed OU fans, I bet that game would rank number one in their all-time favorite game. Well, Barry, you know, teases me about it nowadays because he says that if Billy Sims wouldn't have gotten hurt, if our starting quarterback wouldn't have gotten hurt, we would have never needed you. But I always remind him that, you know, the last thing I saw uh, looking on the sideline, he was on his knees. Uva has always brought this up through the years. Uva has always said, Coach, this is probably the biggest play you've had in your career as a, uh, a Sooner coach. And that's usually when Uva's had a few pops. We've been at social gatherings, at games and all, when the kick is brought up. And I always look at Uva and I say, Uva, let me tell you something. If Thomas had re-injured his hamstring and Billy, Billy had twisted his ankle, we'd hung half a hundred on Ohio, Ohio State. We wouldn't have needed your kick, but I'm glad you were there. So this was a, a very good football team. We had lost two games that year early. People didn't probably consider us the vintage team that we really probably were because we had lost to uh, Texas, a great Texas team. And we lost to a team that a lot of people probably didn't have any respect for uh, uh, that uh, here in Norman that uh, was led by a guy named John Elway from Stanford in Lincoln in November under the, those gray leaden skies with OU in the house. Well, yeah, I remember it being a rather cold, gray day, and uh, uh, I think Nebraska was rated number one and Oklahoma number two. This game demonstrates how narrow the line is between victory and defeat. 1980 uh, game against Nebraska was another great comeback victory late in the fourth quarter. Uh, this was our opportunity to play Nebraska again for the Big 8 Conference Championship. J.C. Watts was our quarterback, uh, outstanding player from Buffalo, Oklahoma. This was his senior year. He had been the returning quarterback from the Big 8 Champions in 1979, the Sooners, who had defeated the Florida State in the Orange Bowl. And he was the most valuable player in the Orange Bowl. The thing I remember about the ball game was that we had made a pact with the Sun Bowl that we would play in the Sun Bowl. Jimmy Rogers, executive director of the Sun Bowl, John Fulmer, Sun Bowl, great guys. They had traveled and seen the Sooners play a bunch, and uh, they thought maybe we were going to lose at Lincoln. And they invited us this many times to come be at, in their classic in El Paso. But we always kept beating Nebraska, so therefore we couldn't go to the Sun Bowl. We always ended up going to the Orange Bowl. They score the first series. I remember Jarvis Redwine running 80 yards for a touchdown. I'm not sure it wasn't the first or second play of the game. It, it, it stuns us. The throwing of oranges on the field uh, by uh, the Big 8 Conference champion to be uh, has a lot of history to it. All those people up there, they're, they're gaming, they, or they bring all these oranges and everything like, no big deal, we got Oklahoma this year, yeah, it, it uh, Billy Sims is gone, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, they were throwing, they were, they were going goofy up there. But we fight back till it's, uh, we're only down uh, less than a touchdown, and late in the ball game, we had to have a great goal line stand at the goal, uh, at our goal line and hold them on fourth and one. They don't convert. If they had it, they probably would have won the football game and are separated more with a field goal to win it. Everything has to be on the line, it seems to me, for Sooner Magic to make an appearance. And now with less than, oh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but it was, it was oh, no more than a couple of minutes left in the game. We've got to go 80 yards for a touchdown. You could tell the frustration of the Nebraska people just again, waiting for something bad to happen. It's like they expected something bad to happen. Nebraska almost be expected Sooner Magic, and that was sort of the uh, that was sort of the feeling I think Nebraskans had. We go uh, uh, 80 yards to I think about the one or two yard line. I'll never forget. I was up. I was up. They put me up uh, in the rafters. I was right next, right next to the uh, uh, Nebraska coaches. When Ryan made that run, I hear a shout from the Nebraska coach, they're doing it to us again. A Nebraska ball boy 
is, uh, is running, sprinting down the sideline to get in position. And uh, he sees the long run by, Jim, by Buster Rhymes. And he's right by Jim Weeks. And he, and he just grabs his head and he says, oh no, they're going to do it to us again. Never will forget that the Nebraska coach is screaming, they're doing it to us again. Corey, I'm sitting right there. And it was just sort of like, oh no, here we go again. And that's the way the people around me felt, because that's what they said. They started to just get up and leave, I think, about that time. Buster Ryan scores from about the one out, and uh, we win the ball game in the last few seconds again at Lincoln. And of course, it just stuns them again. Uh, it just seemed like oh, you had their number, and even you know 76, they had them backed up, made two trick plays, beat them, and then 80 OU had sort of struggled and uh, uh, wasn't really good by OU standards. They were able to succeed that day under those conditions, and um, and and there was a period of time uh, when Nebraska almost be expected. Sooner magic. After the game, the people in Nebraska, I never seen them get out of a stadium so quickly. They were just sick. And I think that makes it all the sweeter after they've thrown oranges. Uh, they have to go home with no victory and no oranges. Uh, they just dropped their oranges and left. You had a sea of oranges in the stadium uh, when, uh, when everybody was gone and they, they, they were just shell shocked. You know, going that same, that same direction there, I guess it's going uh, north to south in Lincoln, uh, in that south end zone at, at Memorial Stadium. Uh, the Sooners did it to him again. Uh, it wasn't the first and it wouldn't be the last. Hey, hey, no one thing. Are there any good Mexican restaurants in Miami? Ah! In 1981, if someone had said that Barry Switzer's Sooners would win with their passing game, you were sure to get a good laugh. But ask the Florida State Seminoles, and it's no laughing matter. In 1981, uh, we played uh, Florida State in the Orange Bowl. This is, of course, after Sooner Magic had happened at Lincoln, Nebraska, and we came back and won uh, that ball game in the last minute. So we had a similar situation in the Orange Bowl, our next ball game, when we played Florida State. We had dominated the game the year before, Billy Sims senior year. JC and the Sooners rushed for over 400 yards in a game and winning 24 to seven, I believe, against Florida State when they were 11 and 0. You know, it's always difficult to play a, a Florida school in Florida. And, and that was the case in the 81 Orange Bowl. People forget how difficult that is because it's not just uh, the uh, adversarial nature of the football game. It's the two weeks beforehand. It was their time for revenge and they nearly pulled it off. The other thing about the Orange Bowl, I think, is that uh, that's when we sort of figured it out. And I don't know that we knew it while, while it was happening, but J.C. Watts was a winning quarterback. J.C. Watts was an excellent passer. And he demonstrated that in 1981 in, in the Orange Bowl against Florida State. J.C. Watts sometimes is a forgotten man among a lot of Oklahoma fans for whatever reason. Well, J.C. Watts didn't have a Joe Washington in his back in his backfield. J.C. Watts was a pretty good politician, but he's a better quarterback. This guy goes up to the Canadian Football League and is the player of the year up there. Barry Switzer's often said that if J.C. Watts was playing now, he'd be in the NFL because that's exactly what they're looking for with J.C. Watts. They got a cheap touchdown. Uh, the, the only score they got in the second half was a ball snapped over our punter's head in the end zone. They recovered it for a touchdown. It was our mistake, but it was a cheap touchdown for them. But it was a, a tightly played game between two good football teams, but the end of the game was sort of improbable. Having lost Heisman winning running back Billy Sims, who had been the difference maker the year before, Switzer changed the plan on the game-winning drive, calling five pass plays. Watson Rhodes connected on a 42-yarder early in the drive. You know, an unsung hero of Sooner Magic is Steve Rhodes. He's a flanker from Dallas, but he came up big in big games. He was big in 76 as a true freshman at Lincoln. 
And in his last game as a fifth-year senior down in the Orange Bowl, he makes a huge catch to get the Sooners uh, rallied from a 17-10 deficit. We won 80 yards in a minute to go in the game. We completed six out of seven passes, and uh, J.C. Watts scrambled for a first down. Watts' 10-yard run brought OU down to the 11. Watts capped the 78-yard drive when he found wide receiver Steve Rhodes in the end zone from 11 yards out to cut the lead to 17-16 with 127 remaining. They made play after play after play. And, I'm, and I, I, at that time, somebody told me, remember, National Riders said, the difference then between Oklahoma and Nebraska, which two great option teams, was when Oklahoma had to have the big pass play, they can make it. Never one to back down from a gutsy call with the game on the line. Barry Switzer decided to go for two and call another pass play. Can you imagine Switzer ever going for a tie? The Seminoles were caught off guard as Watts rolled to his right and hit tight end Forrest Valora. He rolls right, fakes the option, uh, everybody converges, and he rolls out and tosses a little dump pass to Forrest Valora. And he was wide open. And J.C. got him the ball, and, and uh, we won the football game. And uh, again, Oklahoma's winning games like that. I just think people in the Orange Bowl said, OK, Oklahoma's going to win. What Coach Switzer was able to do very effectively for many years was to instill confidence that Sooner Magic was getting ready to happen. The idea that this was so unusual that Oklahoma would turn to the pass, which, what, produces Sooner Magic. Bobby Bowden had actually, as I understand the story, had sent a trainer to the locker room to get a sport coat to, to receive the championship trophy a couple of minutes prior to the end of the game. But uh, that didn't happen. J.C. was again named most valuable player, and I guess another example of Sooner Magic. To me, that was J.C. Watt's stamp, that game. The wins over Bobby Bowden were classic Switzer and classic J.C. Watt's. The thing that I remember so well about this is there was, of course, pandemonium on the field at the end of the game, shortly after the, the pass play, and uh, uh, a report, sideline reporter shoved a, a microphone into J.C. Watt's face, and he said, we won the game, we won the game, hello to Bell's Laundry. And Bell Peterman was my neighbor, and I could hear her shrieking down the street. She, she ran Bell's Laundry. It was the greatest thing to be able to hear this exchange in stereo. And once again, Oklahoma crushed Florida State's hopes of an upset. There's one word used to describe one of the most heated rivalries in all of college football, Bedlam. In addition to state bragging rights, Bedlam has created many memorable moments and unforgettable plays. The 1983 Bedlam game would put two players in the hearts of Sooner fans forever, Derek Shepard and Tim Lasher. Th that 83, we weren't a very good football team that year. We were floundering around and uh, uh, Marcus Dupree had come the year before and uh, run every back we had in our running stable off and uh, running back stable and then he left that year himself so I had two redshirt freshmen uh, Spencer Tillman and Earl Johnson and Danny Bradley at quarterback we were got away from the wishbone we were in the eye formation we were kind of wallowing around trying to find a direction to be offensively. Oklahoma was really after a Texas loss Marcus Dupree had just quit the team there were injuries Stanley Wilson and all this, I mean, it was just. There's different types of walk-ons in a program, and you know, Derek Shepard had somewhat of a family tradition playing Sooner football, and he was more of what I would call a recruited walk-on, where they knew about him. They, he was pretty, pretty much treated as a scholarship player. He just didn't have, you know, any scholarship given to him until after he'd earned it. Um, I literally drove up and walked into the equipment room and was looking for a coach that would talk to me. And you know, I had to prove I had insurance and you know stuff like that. We were preseason number two when that season started out. We lost Ohio State. We got beat by Texas. Marcus Dupree had just left the team that week, uh, and so we appeared to be unraveling at the seams a little bit. 
that week was a week that Oklahoma State thought it was going to be their year to take Oklahoma. And our, Jimmy Johnson was, he hated OU. Absolutely hated, he hated Switzer by then. And I just remember that whole week listening to Jimmy Johnson talk about how he felt like, you know, they were in the top 20, which it was top 20 at the time, and, and they'd gotten in the top 20, and they just thought this was going to be their year. I remember driving to Stillwater, and they were all kind of very negative signs for Oklahoma on I-35 and going in, in, into Stillwater. As we were driving up there on, on the bus up there, one of our players, uh, Mitch Bryan, who was Ricky Bryan's brother, uh, turned to me. I was sitting next to him, and he said, hey, if you got to kick a game-winning field goal today, What's going to happen? And of course, I was a freshman, and I just said, "Well, of course I'll make it." You know, I was just you know talking trash as much as anything else. And uh, we got up there, and um, it was a sold-out stadium. Um, and Oklahoma State really felt like they had a chance to beat us. And Oklahoma State had not beaten Oklahoma in eons, and uh, this was a game. But believe it or not, OSU just dominated. You just figured, okay, this was going to be Oklahoma State's chance to win the game, even though OU's dominant, fumbling the ball. They dropped the ball. It was just, it was then what they called the Texas hangover. It was 20 to 3 with 11 minutes left. And the Sooners had no offense. I mean, none. You want to say you've got to believe. And you always believe you're in a football game. But I remember that for me, I was sitting on the sidelines thinking this just is not our day. Talk about a bad spot for Oklahoma. They were a much better team uh, that day. But the injuries, Oklahoma dominates the first three quarters of the game, and they're behind. As a matter of fact, really, in the fourth quarter, we as OSU broadcasters, during a timeout, said, you know, this is boring. We're beating the center so badly. There's no way they're going to win that game. And really, you know, what? The, the life was out of OU, and the spirit was gone, and they, nothing was going on. One man resurrected OU. I think that was as close to as uh, of a case of one guy saving the Sooners, and that man was Derek Shepard. The Derek Shepard story is, is a poignant one because he died at an early age. But in this game, as it turns out, you might say this was his finest hour in uniform. Derek and I were both guys, I think the people like to talk about it a little bit because we were undersized, you know, and, and walk-on players. But we both did make some plays in that particular football game, and, and Shep really got everything going. Sooners are lifeless, no offense, but they throw a little dump pass to Derek Shepard over on the sideline with about 11 minutes left. They're down 17, and uh, you know OSU gives him the catch. They're playing back, two guys converge. Derek Shepard jukes them both and goes 70-something yards for a touchdown. Uh, they just played it poorly, and uh, we were able to capitalize on a good play with Derek Shepard. If they don't throw the ball to Derek Shepard on that play, they lose the game. When we scored that touchdown, we thought, well, man, we've got some life back in us. All of a sudden, you know, there was hope. All of a sudden, it wasn't a lost cause. All of a sudden, OSU had a little doubt creep in. When you win games against Nebraska or you win games against Oklahoma State, if you have your opponent believing that there's a chance that they're going to get beat, that's the ultimate. And that started happening in that football game. The tide started to turn a little bit. I mean, I, I look back and think uh, Derek Shepard, uh, Derek Shepard did a lot for a lot of people that, with that one play. It was a game that obviously thought they had won. Our players played hard as their players did play hard. And still it looked like a fairly hopeless situation. All OSU has to do is field the ball and run out the clock. So I know that we gave them cheap touchdowns. We're a pretty good defensive football team though. Oh, for crying out loud. You know what? I felt sorry for OSU that day. I really did. Barry Switzer originally ordered uh, an onside kick but the onside kick leading up to the field goal was actually you know, something that was even more dramatic. Probably the most amazing play, one of the most amazing plays in OU OSU history. We lined up to kick uh, an onside kick, uh, but we didn't know whether we were gonna kick onside kick. I don't know if the coaches, the coaches, one coach knew it was coming, one coach didn't know it was coming. They say, uh, we're gonna onside kick, and then they say, you know what, we're not gonna onside kick. Except they don't tell the kicker. And we got confused uh, on the sideline between the coaches and the players, and no one really knew, even including me, that what was gonna happen. And standing in the middle of the huddle, Barry Switzer comes over and he says, Bobby, I want to kick the ball deep. And Proctor says, no, I need, we need the ball back. And Switzer looked at Bobby and then turned and walked away without saying a word. So <laughs> I'm looking at Bobby Proctor and the guys, and we all just go out there. 
And the last thing we'd heard is we're going to go ahead and kick the ball on side. So I go up to the referee, and he hands me the football, and, at, and we're standing at the 40-yard line, and they get word that we are going to change our mind. So all the onside kick personnel comes off. The regular kickoff team comes on, and Dwight Drain was given the assignment of telling everybody that didn't that was on both teams to make sure they knew that we were kicking the ball deep. Well, I was 10 yards in front of him, and so he never came up to talk to me about it. So while the referee is giving me the football, and he's asking me, what are you going to do? And I'm, I'm reluctant to tell him anything that I'm doing even. So I get lined up, and I put the ball down. And I'm naive enough to think that the guys are going to notice that, you know, I'm kicking on side by the way I'm lined up. And, of course, they don't know anything like that. So uh, I just did the last thing I'd heard, and I tried to kick it on side and miss hit the ball and bounced off Chris Rockin's face. And Scott Case made an incredible play. Uh, you know, to have the presence of mind to catch a ball in the air that was just a rocket coming right back at him was, was something else. There's no explanation. Sooner Magic doesn't even account for that onside kick. A lot of Sooner fans throw around a, uh, a uh, line that I don't, I, I don't even, I don't believe in it. I really don't appreciate it. And they call it the Aggie factor. But golly, you know, it's, it's hard to defend uh, anything when, when that happens. That is pure Sooner Magic. He didn't even know what he was attempting to do. I'll be honest with you. Tim Lasher had kicked before that day. He had kicked, I forgot, maybe one field goal or tried a field goal, a couple extra points, something. I mean, it wasn't his debut, but I wasn't paying attention. I'd never heard of him until that day. I had never heard of him until that day, and I was saying, who is this guy? Who is Tim Lasher? Well, there's sometimes it works to your advantage when you're naive about things. <laughs> uh, going into the Oklahoma State game, I'd tried three field goals that year. He trots out there. 46-yard field goal. Now, let me say this. Unlike the Ohio State kick, I was not confident that uh, that ball's going through. I was thinking, now, if this was 26 or 36, okay, but 46-yard field goal from this guy I've never heard of uh, in a crosswind at Lewis Field, East-West Field, uh, I wasn't buying it. If you wanted to set the stage for it to be an exciting finish and nobody knowing whether this kid is going to be able to make this field goal or not, it was perfect for that. And what, what's amazing, people don't remember in that game, Tim Lasher kicks a winning field goal. To the, he was a freshman. That was the longest field goal of his career. Never kicked one longer. They come back with the magical victory. Barry Switzer maybe saves his job. You know, he, 1983, Switzer was in hot water. Oh, it was just uh, stunned silence from the OSU fans. I went to a little gathering afterwards, and no one was really even talking about the game. They could not believe it. Uh, when you think you finally you got the game won against your arch enemy. A little celebration and things, and uh, at the end, it was total disbelief. Because I, I actually think fans had left the stadium because it was so boring. I'm serious in the fourth quarter. Oh, you couldn't do anything. And the, the reaction was just, they were just astounded. The most incredible thing I've ever seen in a football game. It was one of those other Sooner comebacks, uh, I wouldn't ca certainly call it Sooner magic, it was a Sooner bumble fumble around that day, but we were good enough to beat the OSU and that's good enough for me. The last time we were in Lincoln, which was in 84, Nebraska probably had a stronger football team than, than we did. In 86, Nebraska had lost the game to Colorado, and so they already had a conference loss. They had to win the game to be the Big 8 conference champions. We knew we could tie it and, and still and win the conference. In, in Lincoln, every year then, you, hear, you go to Lincoln, this is the greatest Nebraska team of all time. Go, oh, okay. The thing I remember about that game, though, that was one time when Barry Switzer truly did outsmart Tom Osborne. Strategy-wise, he just completely outfoxed him. 1986 was a, a, a game we were defending national champions. This was a game for the Orange Bowl. We were a highly ranked football team in the top three or four in the country. I would say the 86 game was, was really one of the most uh, improbable uh, games that I recall because 
uh, we were ahead in the ball game. Nebraska got, got control of the game. You think the game is over. And again, it was a game that we didn't feel like we were really playing to our abilities and, and we felt like we were the best team in 86, but we weren't doing what we needed to do to, to score. Sometimes you take for granted when you're in the family, part of it, you don't know what it looks from the outside. With all the respect the people have around the country of Oklahoma football. That's a lot of responsibility. It came down to a tight fit at the end of the ball game. Nebraska again in late the fourth quarter thought they had the game won. It was 17 to 10. Uh, it was late in the ball game and I, I believe Oklahoma was fairly deep in their territory and they had a fourth down play. And uh, normally you'd punt, but time was growing short, and so they, they went for the first down. Sooners have the wind at, the, at their back. You want to be going south in the fourth quarter at Lincoln. We took a drive and uh, got to midfield. There's Jamel Holloway, who was not a great passer, but it's like when he had to make a pass play, he was able to. Jamel Holloway hit Keith Jackson on a touchdown pass in the corner right as he went into the end zone. Late in the fourth quarter, Sooners get within 17-16. Barry Switzer sends out the extra point team. Kicks the extra point to tie, because that would put OU in the Orange Bowl. Nebraska had, uh, had lost that year. So Sooners are going to the Orange Bowl with a tie, and, and Switzer, uh, Switzer said, you know what, I'm playing for the conference title. Let's go, let's go for the tie. So we were able to tie it up, make it 17 to 17. Once we tied the game, I never thought we were going to be able to win it. I thought, well, we tied it, so we still, you know, we got to, we'll get a ring. <laughs> Bad get basically. But Charlie North uh, came up to me and said, Tim, make sure you're ready. We may get the ball back. He outfoxed Osborne in that regard because not he was playing for more than the tie. Because all of a sudden, there's a minute and a half left, whatever it is. Nebraska goes out, tied, but they got to try to score. I got to believe in the back of his mind, he was thinking, you know what? We can tie this game up, we're going to get the ball back. And I still got Keith Jackson on my side. He hadn't, he hadn't transferred, he hadn't graduated. Steve Taylor goes out there, incomplete, 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 incomplete. Osborne should have run some options, should have done something, anything but four straight passes. Nebraska punts into the win. OU gets good field position. Well, we got the ball back again, and we had a long way to go. We were deep in our own territory and did not convert a fourth down. As a matter of fact, we fumbled the play, I think. It looked like we had Oklahoma beat. And we're, we fumbled a lot that day. Remember, we had returned the ball over some. We always fumbled, seemed to fumble against them. And, uh, we got a call for a face mask penalty and uh, it kept him alive. We were able to move the ball in and, and uh, get field position. And I was on the sidelines, because yeah, they come down late in the game so I could get to the press line. And I, so I was on the sidelines. The OU players, it's like, they believed. When the other side, I just, again, you get the feeling that the Nebraska fans, uh-oh, this is gonna happen to us again. And sure enough, that's what happened. And as we started driving down the field, you just realized that Nebraska was over there thinking, here we go again. We were able to get the ball at midfield and we hit uh, Keith Jackson a one-handed catch on a flare route down the boundary and a uh, wheel route. He made a great one-handed catch and had the presence of mind not to cut back because there were, it was less than 20 to 30 seconds on the clock. He was such a great athlete. He not only made the catch, he was able to run down the sidelines with it. And he goes back down the boundary instead of cutting it uh, into midfield uh, to possibly try to score the touchdown, he knew that if he tight ropes the sidelines, he could step out with a few seconds left, which he did to set up position for a, a field goal. The pass to Key Jackson was absolutely one of the greatest catches in OU history. Keith Jackson, you know, was playing for a team that threw the ball maybe 12 times a game. 
you can, you can just imagine what Keith Jackson would do in the offense that OU's running today. Uh, he was uh, he was a very special football player, and that's that's part of what makes up that Sooner magic we're talking about. We run out on the field, set up our field goal, step the ball, we kick the ball, and so we just put the ball down and, and kicked it and walked away with the, the 2017 win, and it, it was another another great moment for the Oklahoma Sooners in Lincoln, Nebraska. But it looked like we had them, you know, and so that was really difficult to um, to experience that loss. It's really reflective of the, the kinds of plays that are the benchmarks of the OU Nebraska series where Sooner Magic intervenes. Tom Osborne it just didn't come out on the right side of things a lot with Barry Switzer. Oh, you got to believe got to believe, man. We've done this to him so many times. They believe it's going to happen, and we know it's going to happen. You know, Switzer likes Osborne. He would never say anything negative about Tom Osborne, but in his mind, he had to think, you know what? I got him today. At that time, the people were getting upset with Tom Osborne. How can you how can you get upset with this great coach? And here they were again for the second year in a row in Lincoln, uh, playing the Cornhuskers for all the marbles. In 1987, when we went to Lincoln, we were undefeated, and they were undefeated. It was uh, number one versus number two. Uh, Oklahoma had been a machine with Jamel Holloway running the wishbone, and Lydell Carr, you know, the great running back, uh, the great fullback in the bone. Uh, made OU uh, a, a force to be reckoned with offensively. But with both of those gone, Oklahoma was very much neutralized on offense. Oklahoma's in there with a, a freshman quarterback in Charles Thompson, who had his first start the week before. I remember Charles, he stunk. He was terrible. Because you're going with a, a redshirt freshman quarterback, Charles Thompson, who was fabulously talented, but you know, woefully inexperienced. And I remember Charles Thompson on that day, under those circumstances, looking so small and spindly. You know, he wasn't very big, and he, and he wasn't muscular. He was, he was extremely quick and fast and talented. And he wore around his neck uh, a, a headband, but he wore it around his neck, uh, upon which he had used a marker and written, Hanta Yo, which was the war cry of his high school team in Lawton. And it was a touching thing to me because he was about 19 years old and here he was playing on national television before over 80,000 people in the stands starting for the Oklahoma Sooners against Nebraska in Game of the Century 2. And what, was he, what gave him comfort was, was his days at, in, in Lawton playing for his, his Lawton high school team and, uh, of which their war cry was Hanta Yo. No one gave Oklahoma a chance to win the game because he took over for Holloway he played terrible against uh, Missouri the week before. Nebraska was proclaiming themselves the best defense of all time. There was a lot of buildup to the game. In fact, not only were we both undefeated in high-ranked teams, it was because uh, the Nebraska players said they had the, that we didn't have the keys to their house. We, we're we're going to get the keys to our house back, or they can't have the keys to our house. All these metaphorical references, uh, which now are somewhat humorous. Uh, Broderick Thomas, those guys uh, uh, played defense for Nebraska, were great players, great defensive team. Uh, we're doing a lot of uh, slap uh, talk. I don't know if that's the word, it's slap talk or smack talk or whatever the word they use. I've never used that word myself very often, but uh, there was a lot of conversation in the newspapers about uh, they were gonna handle us. Stadium at Nebraska has been built onto about 12 times. There's seats everywhere at all different angles, and every seat is taken by someone in a red parka. And it's, it's very intimidating. They were so cocky. Those words about coming into our house were intended to be intimidating. And I remember this, uh, Steve Taylor, the quarterback, had made the statement about uh, how well they would do offensively against us, and they expected to score in the 30s. And, and I remember the day before uh, we traveled, I had a team up and we were talking about the challenge ahead of us and, and uh, about a tough game it was going to be. One of our players, I'll never forget, I think it was Daryl Reed, Troy Johnson, made the comments as coaches. You know, I don't understand why they think that uh, 
they're going to be able to score the points they think they can on us. They haven't scored but three touchdowns in three years, and uh, we're the same defensive team they've had to play against for three, uh, for three years. What makes them think that? I said, I guess it's because they just were playing there, and they think they've got enough courage to say that, and said, we're going to have to go prove them wrong. But, you know, without Jamel, I mean, Jamel was so good, and to take him out with a guy who was fast and talented, but you didn't know how, how he could run the option. You didn't know if he could pass. Well, let me tell you what happened in the opening series of the ball game. They took the ball and drove the length of the field and they scored on their first possession of the ball game. Barry Switzer had taken Charles aside in the locker room and again instilling the kind of confidence that we've talked about here today, which is the foundation of Sooner Magic, and told Charles, you will shock the nation today. For the next 12 possessions that they had the ball, they did not make a first down. We totally dominated the football game. They could not make a first down. You know, that just proves that talk never has mattered. It didn't matter then, doesn't matter now. Just go out and play, you know. Uh, Bosworth talked in the 80s and, you know, people talk all the time. That, that kind of stuff doesn't matter. Hey, here's the thing, uh, Leroy Salmon never said a word. And all he was was the best player of all time. So, you know, I don't, I don't pay attention to talk. Charles Thompson didn't play like he did the week before. There's a freshman making play at the play. And are you kidding me? No one thought that was going to happen. Charles Thompson played a masterful game, running the wishbone, throwing occasion. I mean, he, he, was, a, he was a magician. Holloway couldn't have performed any better. Charles Thompson, as I recall, ran an option toward the west sideline. He managed to get a pitch off late. It was Collins that had the ball and went up to sideline and scored and he was just, you know, just barely in bounds. But that's the thing the wishbone did to you. It really stretched you sideline to sideline. I mean, the Sooners just went out there and, and said, you know what, we're a little bit better than you. We're not a lot better than you, but we're a little bit better than you. And we're gonna prove it. And that's what they did for 60 minutes. Oklahoma, uh, rather than throwing long passes, oftentimes hit the home run or the option. And uh, that was one of those days where they, uh, again, uh, big game, they came from behind to win. We totally dominated the game that day and our football team uh, being a totally dominant team. We dominated Nebraska and they were ranked number one. And, and when the team, as good as they were, can only make uh, uh, one scoring drive and have a possession of 12 consecutive possessions and not make a first down, that's, uh, that's total domination. And to have a young, spindly-legged, quarterback come in and run roughshod over the black shirts is, is nothing more than Sooner Magic. I'm sure you would agree. The 1988 was, in my mind, the best Oklahoma-Oklahoma State game ever played. That was probably the best Bedlam football game of my memory. I think most people go to an Oklahoma Sooner football game hoping to see something spectacular. And, and the spectacle of the event can be uh, something positive or it can be something negative. But nonetheless, that's why you paid for the ticket, is to see something unique, something spectacular. And that day there were multiple things that were spectacular at Lewis Field. The mystique of playing Oklahoma is basically a thorn in Oklahoma State's side. We were, uh, we were not quite as good a football team as we had been in 85, 86, 87. Uh, we, uh, but still, we're a very good football team. That was a heck of a game. Now, whereas in, in 83, I got the feeling that OSU just sort of gave it away you know, just sort of disintegrated. That was a heck of a, that was a heck of a bloodbath in 88. 
we uh, were a very good football team. They were too. Uh, they had a great offensive football team. Oklahoma State actually had the better team. And I'm not saying that just because I happened to be doing OSU at the time. They had the better offensive team without question. In, in fact, if their defensive team had been as good as their offensive football team, they might have won the national championship. Uh, the defense was not uh, in much better than OU if it's good. But OSU had a tremendous offensive team with Hartley Dykes, Mike uh, Gundy, and of course the great Barry Sanders. The guy that uh, made them what they were was uh, Barry Sanders, who's, who in my opinion, and I've always said, and my opinion's my opinion, but I've always said that this guy's the best running back that ever put a ball in his arm, and I coached a lot of great ones at Oklahoma. Sanders had a great day, set the stage for OSU to win the game. That was one of those one-on-one uh, -on -one battles, Barry Sanders versus Mike Gaddis uh, running up and down the field. I remember the first play, Mike Gaddis touched the ball. The freshman running back ran 50 yards for a touchdown uh, on a counter play, busted right up the middle, great cut back. I mean, that was just back and forth. That was a fabulous football game. The game was just back and forth, and uh, Oklahoma State launched this final drive. Oklahoma State was down by only three points with a minute left in the game. And uh, the referee made a very questionable call. Then disaster struck the Cowboys. OSU got what it considered was the bad penalty, bad call on Garrick Lindbrick. Uh, taunting or whatever it was, pushed him back. OSU was backed up to midfield with a fourth and 35. The Cowboys would have one last shot at the end zone with a chance to show that the Sooners went the only team capable of magical endings. I, you know, I was on the Oklahoma sidelines and I, I just got a feel then that Oklahoma State's gonna win the game. I mean, they're gonna, they're, they're gonna win the game. Mike Gundy, OU defense couldn't stop Mike Gundy, couldn't stop Hartley Dykes, they couldn't, no one stopped Barry Sanders that year, it was amazing. But they're down. Uh, they got to throw the pass in the end zone. But the pass from Mike Gundy to, I won't mention the receiver, the ball was right to him, right in his hands, in the end zone for the win. The game's over, Oklahoma State wins it, right? Well, he drops the pass. And he drops it. We still don't know to this day whether Kevin Thompson got his finger on the ball or not. Well, when I was doing the game, remember I'm doing Oklahoma State, I said, and it's, that time I hit my microphone, knocked the clear off my head on the, it crashed down on the floor. I said, he dropped the ball. You can kind of hear it in, as an echo. <laughs> you know, I, I never saw the pass. I, I, I had the four seat in the house, and I never saw the guy miss the pass. I guess I was in the wrong angle, but uh, someone said, uh, he had a chance to make a play. I don't know whether that's true or not, but uh, the fans certainly thought that at the time. Again, the fans are the same disgusted feeling. The, I think some of them want to hang Parker. I hope that night he hit out. Of course, there was some angry Oklahoma State, State fans. They was going to get a vigilante after him, try to track him down. If I was. If I was him, I'd, I'd say, stay in your apartment, drink heavily. That would be advice I would have given to him that night. The poor guy, I felt so sorry for him, still do to this day. You know, I feel sorry for Brent Parker. We, we talked, Brent Parker's name came up in the office just the other day. I mean, let's go do a story on Brent Parker. What's it like 16 years after you dropped the pass? I think that Oklahoma State is never going to beat Oklahoma if they can't beat him then in 88 with that pass right in Parker's hands and he drops it. I was just immensely relieved uh, to see the drop pass because, because it was right in the bread basket. That defined Sooner Magic, but it also defined Sooner Luck, and it also, I think, defined Oklahoma State saying we got a curse over us when we play Oklahoma. They would have beaten OU that day, uh, but some people can say, and I think make a legitimate claim, that that's also Sooner Magic. With every, every season, um, there's always promise at the beginning. You know, you come in in shape, you fit, you know, um, and we had just changed coaches again, and 
the coaching job landed in the hands of John Blake. And everything was looking so promising. And as we began to go through the season, turmoil and difficulties and not winning to uh, satisfy the Sooner Beast, you know, um, it had got rough. Oklahoma gets beat at home by Tulsa, Kansas, and TCU. Are you kidding me? This was a bad Oklahoma team. OU comes in 0-4, and, and you're thinking, hey, they may not win a football game, because it looked like they were capable of losing them all. No one, and I mean nobody, picked Oklahoma to win this game. Uh, Texas, I remember, was a 21-point favorite in the game. Going into the game, we was, I mean, we were just hoping we can get a win, play well, and uh, just make big plays. It was my first OU Texas game. I saw it on TV. I had I was red shirt year before and went down, and it was just something special. Texas was winning all the close games. After when Switzer left, Oklahoma, you talk about Texas magic. Uh, Oklahoma couldn't get a break in the series. Like any other game, it's a rivalry game. OU Texas, no matter what the record is, no matter who's ranked, who's not ranked. I mean. Both teams gonna play hard. Texas had Ricky Williams, uh, James Brown was a quarterback, um, a couple of nice wide receivers, so I'm, they were capable of, of uh, putting up points. Like the day before, I jumped off sides and pregame, and Dick Winderman ran the whole stadium. He said he didn't care if I made the bus or not. And I ran the whole stadium, barely made it on the bus. And... James Allen is one of the underappreciated people in OU football history. He was not an All-American. He was not in the, you know, in the lineage of Pruitt, Washington, Sims, uh, whoever you want to put on that list. Coming in, he worked hard in the offseason, came back with a great attitude. I mean, he was carrying the load. He was our leader. But he was a heck of a football player. He was a good football player. The NFL wrote him a check for five years. They don't, they don't hand out charity in the NFL. I had got to know James. I was living in Norma at the time. I used to work out with him during, during, the, uh, during the season and everything. And, uh, Great player. He was paving the way for us young guys, and I mean, we watched him and took everything we could from James. I mean, James was, was like a big brother to most of us that was freshmen, like me and DeMond. I mean, we really watched him and took a lot from what he did. I mean, because he had been through the battles, and I mean, he had took all the criticism he could take. I mean, and he kept his head up and he played hard. I have an attitude of like, just give me the opportunity to really, really, you know, shine on this day. I even said a prayer. And we was all sitting there and the chapel was going on and out of nowhere a door busting over. Billy Sims come flying in. Basically he just told us, hey, let's go out and win and let's get it done, but not in them many words, you know. If it those of y'all know Billy Sims, you know probably what he said. DeMond Parker was a redshirt freshman running back who Blake and his staff were highly on and I was on my way out as a senior and my starting role had was being challenged by that and he had won prior to the Texas Texas game and I wasn't starting. They dubbed him the answer. Uh, I always wondered what was the question. Uh, we we started out typical sooner ball that year, not looking too good. I actually, the first touchdown I scored, I snuck in the game. I wasn't even supposed to be in. I just put myself in, caught a touchdown pass from Justin. And, and well, I just ran out on the field, really, pulled Gerald Williams out, and uh, they called a play. And it was a corner route, scored a touchdown. And, Next thing you know, I mean, he, when he finally realized it was Jerrell, you know, he said something to me. But then after that, I was, I was in the rotation because I had been hurt like for about three games. I remember um, my first play was like for like 35 yards, I think. It was uh, a, a screen play and I came back to the sideline and I was like, this is my day. Oklahoma didn't have a chance. And then as the game was progressing, go, yeah, that's nuts. They were not winning this game, Texas is winning. At, at that point in time, in that season, 10 points was like 35. <laughs> you know what I mean? We were looking at the scoreboard like, dang, we're down by 10 already? I was thinking, man, please, just let us hold on. Let, them, let us embarrass it on national TV. Just let us play well and just let's hang in there. With seeing guys like Dion in the locker room, it was a couple more Cowboys, because Coach Blake had previous ties with the Cowboys. You know, that was major encouragement just, just for them guys to be in our locker room. Really, at halftime, I think Dion Sanders took over, you know, he just basically told us, y'all can win, you know, these guys, they're not better than y'all, I mean, and he said it in a way that only he could say. Right before we got ready to go out, I mean, it, I thought to myself, like, we can't let these people down. We was on the sideline, the return team was like, we gotta make a play, and I think Brock Simpson and Brandon Daniels came to me and just like, follow me, 
when you go to school. And all of a sudden, you just hear people getting louder. But at OU Texas games, you don't know who it is until, you know, you look out there and see. And I just see this 19 just flying down the sideline. 35-30, to the 10, to the 5. I mean, the ball came down, washed it down in my hands. And once I hit the sideline, I mean, all I saw was Brandon in front of me running. And he didn't block nobody, so I knew if he didn't block nobody, <laughs> it was touchdown. He was celebrating with the ball and just slid all the way into the, the uh, Texas fan side. And they was trying to mob him and stuff like that. And we did it on Texas Ian, so I got hit with about every Coke, beer, whatever they had. I mean, it was just a great time. I mean, you, it was a feeling I'll never forget. And I was like, that was, that was like ultimate, ultimate Sooner magic. You know, my dad, he, he was at home watching the game, but he left went to the store. When he got to the store, he had missed the play. And I mean, he, he, I mean, when he got home, everybody told him what happened. He had to watch it on the playback. And I mean, he, he, he just said he just broke down and started crying. So I mean, it was a great play for everybody. And, and it was even cloudy that day. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, you, the sun's out. I think it's, it's awfully sweet when a player from Texas playing for Oklahoma does something spectacular. Jackson saves the Sooners with that punt return late uh, in the fourth quarter. They were down 11, he runs the punt back. A spectacular touchdown run on a kickoff, which enabled Oklahoma to, to believe in themselves that they could win the football game. Jarrell Jackson makes a punt return. Uh, all of a sudden, there's a little life uh, in, in Oklahoma. Once, once that happened, you know, you could hear people on the sideline, Sooner Magic, you know, this is it, this is the one. After that, I mean, it was, we can win. I mean, I think we took the life out of Texas that night. Just a, just a piece that came over me, and I was like, and I told myself, when I get in the game, I'm just gonna play hard. And you can see the player, you can see both sidelines, and you get a feeling on your sidelines, the Oklahoma players thought they were gonna win the game, the Texas players didn't. You hear coaches talk about special teams and how, and how they can change a game. I mean, that right there changed it. He had uh, taken the handoff and was going left uh, to attempt to score, and Stoney Clark, the middle guard, came over and, and stopped him cold at, at the one-yard line. When that happened, I mean, obviously, I think things did turn for me at that point because, you know, that's just the way it works. Uh, I, there were some, oh, Oh, you people are some fans saying, well, it was a bad play to call because Allen was not the fastest back. Why didn't you have Jeff Frazier in the game? Faster than Allen, he probably scores. James Allen gets a chance to, uh, again on short yardage, to win the game against Texas in overtime, which was the first overtime game between OU and Texas in history. And then, just when we thought it couldn't get any better, it did. Putting the ball back in James' hands was, you know, his opportunity to shine, his opportunity to, to get it done. I mean, he was a senior, he was the workhorse. Flat pass caught by Allen at the 12. He's at the 10. He dukes the 5. He's inside for a first down and goal to go. So when the opportunity came and I found myself in that same situation, I was like, man, you know what? There's no way I'm not going to have success today because God has put me in this opportunity again in front of the same people. I think when the game got to overtime, I think the Texas players were just, they just felt they weren't going to win this game. They, of course, they had the game won, and then what Oklahoma did at the end, uh, and James Allen, I mean, you talk about a performance. But man, that was the longest stretch of field I've ever seen in my life, man. It looked like it was like 200 yards, you know? And I'm like, man, I know we're gaining yards, but are we moving, you know, closer? But in the huddle, we're getting excited, man, and the confidence is just building and building. Got guys talking 100 miles per hour, but I got to give Justin credit. You know, he probably doesn't get a lot of credit as Oklahoma Sooner uh, quarterbacks, but that day he was man amongst boys. And I don't think in that position uh, I would have would have had any other quarterback with him. Everybody in the huddle said, follow me. <laughs> I'm like, man, the play is going one way. I'm thinking, man, let's score so we can get off the field, celebrate, because we was tired. I mean, it was, it was one of them games where you was tired. And in the back of my mind, I'm kind of just sitting there, and Justin calls the play, and all I heard was the numbers, you know, toss 38-something. And uh, we hadn't really ran a sweep the whole day. And I'm like, man, why is he calling the sweep play? Big Sexy, well, we call him, yeah, his name is Chris Campbell. 
But uh, Big Sexy was the guard, and Dwayne Chandler was my fullback. And these, these guys like, follow me, follow me. We called a play, and they, they said I had a clear shot all the way to the outside, but you know, all I seen was just a little seam and a little crease. And before I knew it, man, I just ran through a couple of guys. I got some great blocks up front by Dwayne and Chris and uh, the whole team, actually. And I looked up and I was like two yards deep into the end zone. I mean, once he got in there, I mean, it was chaos, pandemonium. I mean, I don't even think he got a chance to get up before he got dog piled. First time we had beat Texas in a while. Before I knew it, man, they jumped on me. My helmet was all in my face, and we sitting there celebrating. I mean, I know I got the ball and ran around the field. I mean, it was just great. Not often do I cheer for guys, but I found myself cheering for James Allen on that day because I thought, you know what? That guy deserves, he deserves a day like this. But that was a tremendously uplifting victory uh, to beat Texas and Allen get his claim that he should have gotten all along. Sooners beat Texas in overtime. Sooners win. 27, Oklahoma the victor, hallelujah, they're jumping all over each other at the north end zone, James Allen the star, James Allen from Winniewood, a great, great game, scores the winning touchdown in overtime. It gave every true James Allen fan and every true Sooner fan uh, a way, a, a, a different way of looking at the character of Sooner football and the character of James Allen. James Allen, the game of his, his lifetime. That was his senior season. Uh, you know, he's, he's paid his dues, he put in his time, he's done a lot for the program. He deserves a day like this. I mean, I think Coach Blake cried after the game, which he cried after every game, but he cried hard after that game. I think the belief was the fans, okay, wow, John Blake is a man who turned the corner. Well, it what didn't turn any corners, uh, so, uh, that, that, that was the feeling after that game, that Blake was going to be at OU a long, long time. It has got to be one of the best feelings um, as a team in my whole life of playing football. He just was amazing in that game. And Lightning in a bottle caught, caught James Allen. He had the game of his life. Is that in a moment of despair, you know, Anything is possible, especially when you got some of the magic with you. I think everybody got a game ball, and it was my first time doing an interview in college. You know, it was pretty fun. Every time then you tried to figure who was going to win the game was, I think, five or six, seven straight years. The underdog won that game. That game just, just kind of helped me uh, realize what the sport is all about. Realize what loyalty is all about and it made me really realize what friendship is all about. Looking back, I think Super Magic had something to play on us because before then we had, we was, we was doing bad. I mean, we didn't get no breaks. That helped me become a better man, better more than it helped me become a better football player. I, I think he used to redeem himself from the year before, and now he had a great game. It had to be Super Magic, I mean, because it was just, everything happened for us like in a sequence in the fourth quarter. It, it, it was just one of those moments to where you understand the meaning of Sooner Magic. It's just a feeling around campus that just, you know, you can't be beat now. When everybody, everybody counted us out. And that was, the, that was the biggest thing about it. And that's what makes that moment so special. And that's what makes Sooner Magic real. It's, it's instilled in you once, I mean, it's nothing said, it's inherited once you become all you Sooner. It was sweet solitude and I'm like, that's it. I can walk away from Oklahoma Sooner football, and no matter what, they'll never forget me because of that. Oklahoma had had this absolutely magnificent run through top-notch competition in the month of October. We knew it was going to be an awfully, like you said, an awfully difficult uh, task to go in there uh, with, a, with a relatively young football team. Nerves. I remember the nerves. I remember how nervous everybody was. It was, uh, you know, a very important game. Uh, the more you win and, and being undefeated at the time, uh, you know, we were number one in the country, had a target on our back. We literally took one game at a time that year because, uh, I mean, going down to College Station, it, it can be brutal. 
uh, as a number one. I believe we're ranked number one in the country, and uh, Kyle Field's been a, a, obviously one of the tougher places in all of the, the Big 12 to go in and win consistently. Uh, they've got a, a great home field advantage in, in that uh, this was going to be a pivotal game and a, and a, and a big step towards you know, getting to the national championship. Uh, I just remember Bob saying we're not going to talk about, you know, we, we got to go in there with the same confidence and, and swagger that, that we've gone through that stretch. And, and But I think down deep we all knew we were going to have to go in there and fight for our lives. All of us thinking, you know, we need to win this game. I was a sophomore. I don't know if I was on the same mental plane as some of those seniors were. I mean, I think they had a determination that, you know, they were looking at this ultimate goal. What I remember first about the game is I'm walking over to the stadium and I hear somebody scream, get off the grass. I think College Station is a nuts bill place. I mean, they're crazy down there. I go, what is this about? You know, I'm just walking on grass over to the stadium. I don't, I don't get some of that stuff. Uh, so it's a, it's a weird place to play. Well, later on, I found out that the grass is sacred in uh, something like that. So they might kill you if you walk on the grass. So I got to the pavement and I found out, but I could die from walking on the grass there. From the uh, cadets who stand at attention for the whole quarter and won't even look, you know, you go up and yell in their face and they won't bat an eye. And uh, you've got the dog running around, Reveille. Well, no, the stadium at a and is a little spooky anyway because it moves. <laughs> The upper deck shakes. I don't know if you've ever sat in the upper deck, but it shakes for crying out loud. And I don't mean I don't mean you think it shakes. I mean you're it's like you're on a ship or something. I mean it's it's a funky place to play. And you know they got it's triple decked uh, on three sides. It's a stadium built to the sky, and then the one end zone's wide open, like you're playing back in uh, you know class two A high school or something. It's just a weird place to play. I think that game A and M is pre perhaps the most difficult place to play that centers play every year. A&M, when people talk about the best home field advantage in, in the Big 12, I'd, I'd probably have to give it to College Station. Double tight end, wide receiver left. Here is the down the line, for, uh, into the end zone for the touchdown as quarterback Mark Ferris. Inside the one, here's the turn, the gift to Toombs, left side. There was, there was a good feeling that, that you know, we were going to let things slip through our fingers. It's a game that A&M is in control of, and I think we're all in the press box going, this is Oklahoma's first loss of the season. You know, in the press box, you can't, uh, I had a friend of mine was kicked out of the press box that day because he was cheering for the Sooners. You got to you got to be neutral. There's no, uh, you have to be Switzerland when you're sitting in the press box. You can't show emotion and cheer. Oklahoma couldn't make the plays. That You talk about a nutty crowd out there. I mean, they're just, that stadium was rocking. It was amazing how loud it was. We played up and down throughout the game. I remember we gave up a couple passes, I believe, to, to Ferguson, Robert Ferguson on the on the boundary. It was almost like toward the end of that game that, that hope was slipping away from us. You had this great season going and nobody expected it this great. And then it looked like the centers had had it there late. As the game turned out, we, we, we got behind and uh, we knew we were going to have to come up with, a, obviously, a couple plays uh, defense. We'd get back in the game. The majority of the game, you know, I think they were ahead. And you just go, okay, the dreams of being number one, they're finished. I had a feeling in the fourth quarter, though, we were down uh, three points at the time. Uh, still, that we, we had, were coming back, we were coming back the entire day that, uh, you know, that the, the season just had that feel that things, you know, that we couldn't lose. The 2000 team, once it got rolling, I mean, it just seemed to me to be a season of destiny. You know, we still felt very positive that we would find a way to make a play there, you know, uh, in the fourth quarter to put ourselves on top. Ante Jones and Torrance Marshall and every, all of them just walking up and down the sideline saying, we're going to make a play, we're going to make a play. But I think the team was on a roll at that point so much that it uh, was clear to me and clear to anyone who has been part of the program and has had that confidence instilled in them that good things were going to happen. They did it. You know, they made, they made a play, the play. <laughs> The Sooner Magic takes over. Uh, the, the entire week, really, leading up to the game, Monday through Thursday, we had worked that play. Well, they, they like to run their, their vertical stretch throughout the middle of the field, and we, we had Torrance kind of matched up with uh, one of their uh, good tight ends running down the middle. And uh, Torrance really hadn't covered it the entire week, uh, even as 
as recently as Thursday before the game, uh, running it against him, uh, he still was, was not in position to, to, to handle his responsibility and to make the play. Brent Venables and Mike Stoops talking about it after the game said, you know what, in practice, every single time, Torrance went the wrong way, or he didn't, he, you know, he didn't make the right cue, or he, you know, he wasn't in the right place. I can remember uh, Coach Venables, my brother Mike, uh, being, being upset about it, and, and hey, we've got to make this play. But then they said, you know what, though? We practiced it over and over and over, and when it, time, when it came time for that play, Terrence Marshall was in the right place. Back is Mark Ferris, quick pass. Hey, hey, hey. Intercepted by Torrance Marshall at the 40. He goes to his right at the 35. He gets the 30. He's down the sideline at the 25, 20, 50, and 5. Touchdown, Oklahoma! So I was down there when the moment came of the interception of Torrance Marshall. Torrance Marshall makes this fabulous interception. Torrance intercepted the ball and I figured, well, at least now we've got the ball in scoring range. And so when Torrance Marshall made the interception and took off running like a halfback, it didn't really stun me. Works to the sideline and, and uh, he's so good at running the football that he just starts weaving his way to the boundary. It just, it looked like slow motion almost. But he was moving so fast. And he, I remember everybody was running down there with him. And then all of a sudden, you look down the boundary, and he's got a clear, clear shot to, to get in. And I just remember following him, uh, following him down the boundary uh, with, with great excitement. To get ready for his, his uh, career as an NFL fullback, he runs it all the way in with Rocky Kalmus clipping everybody he could find. When it counted, uh, Torrance made the play. And um, again, it was, a, it was a great play uh, and, and a great return. I never had he covered it in practice, but sure enough, uh, when it comes in the fourth quarter and, and they run the play, he just happened to, to play the play exactly how we, we wanted him to. Torrance was right back in the middle where he should be, recognized it, and uh, made a great interception and just an incredible run. He, he was just coached well that, that play. I've been made fun of a couple of times because every time that's replayed um, from the one angle or pictures taken, you can see me in the background, like jumping up and down like a schoolgirl. Uh, it was an incredible play, and it was uh, an incredible atmosphere to uh, to be able to pull something like that. It took the, the you know wind right out of all the you know that, that entire stadium. We came up with some great individual plays throughout the the course of the game. You know that your feeling of elation, just what I had expected was coming true. I knew you know you just felt that we were going to make a play to make the difference. I remember not being stunned by it because I felt like it was the the old Sooner Magic days when there were great players and that it was sort of predestined. It was uh, it was a special uh, moment. Um, you know, of, of the season without question. To go down there and win against a decent or a really good A&M team is, is, a, is an achievement. Well, you players are celebrating, uh, and the fans come out of the stands to celebrate, and they're on the grass. Guess who comes out? The cadets. They got these bayonets. I think someone's gonna get bayoneted. Oh, you players are having their dog pile. Their dog pile's going on across America. I mean, uh, th these ROTC guys are taking things much too serious. I mean, protect their little grass. So I, I, I think that someone's going to get bayoneted. If you're a fan going to A&M, do not go on the grass after the game. You could get bayoneted. That's the uh, moral of that story. Uh, it was a great plane ride home. OU was in control of every single game except at A&M, and somebody stepped up to make a play, and that's how championships are won. Oh, it was very emotional, and uh, I think, uh, you know, it was, just, it was just a special win. I, I just thought this was, a, you know, we just felt we were a special team and destined. And I think that's, uh, I think that's part of the beauty of, of Sooner Magic, is that you expect those types to, of things to happen by championship teams with championship players. Uh, it, was a, it was a great night and a, and a great feeling. The fact that he returned it for, you know, for a touchdown, that had a little magic. And it did take Sooner Magic. It took a, uh, you know, a guy to be able to, their quarterback, throw the ball where he threw it and allowed our guy to pick it off. And when you have a season of destiny working, it's sort of like you know the end of the, of the book. And so you don't even need to go there to read it. You know how it's going to end. So to get to that ending, all these things have to take place. And I felt like I kind of knew where the ending was going to be and that it would have to, all these things would take place, including the, the, the win at Texas A&M. And that's probably the first time we, we, we really realized that uh, we had a great shot at that went in the national championship if we, we stayed on course. So that, that game went a long way. Since that game, I would say, 
I mean, our program under Coach Stoops, I mean, really hasn't looked back in the sense that uh, there are no, you know, we expect, our expectations are so much higher now um, since that season and, and quite possibly since that, you know, game and maybe that play. The Alabama and Oklahoma, have, uh, you know, take a back seat to, to no one when it comes to tradition and history and championships. Well, it's obviously a, a game uh, made for, um, you know, TV, two great programs, uh, legendary coaches uh, with tremendous tradition, tremendous fans, tremendous players. You know, that was an interesting game for me because I've known Dennis Franchoni for a long time and have known him to be a, just a great, great football coach and have believed him to be the number two coach if Bob Stoops hadn't come to Oklahoma that he would have probably been the coach. I went in the game just like I, I had grown accustomed to, uh, you know, a couple weeks before when, when I wasn't named the starter. I, you have to accept the role and I was a backup. I didn't know how much action I was going to get to see, if I was going to gonna get uh, a lot of playing time or not, you know, because Quentin was the man. You know, Ronaldo Works came to Oklahoma as someone who uh, people saw as a, a player with great potential, a lot of upside, that was a big, strong, physical kid, that was a great student, a kid with great character. But he didn't have a lot of opportunities or hadn't really shown himself to be a, a star player. So going in, it, it was a big deal, and uh, obviously uh, playing a uh, coach Franchi on football team, we knew they were going to be well prepared and well coached. And uh, again, we knew uh, it was a very talented football team. I don't think the Alabama fans going into the game thought they could win the game or were going to win the game. I don't think we ever went into the game thinking it was going to be a blowout. Well, we always, uh, when we when I coached here, uh, had tremendous pride in, in the way we played defense. You know, to win, uh, you know, this game or any particular game, you always have to play great defense. I know we all felt bad uh, seeing the exact situation again right on our sideline. I was hurting for Jason because I knew that he was going down, you know, I figured, man, how can this happen again, you know? Well, it was disappointing for Jason to, uh, you know, to, you know, to suffer another knee injury and, and to be down and, and uh, tore another ligament. And, uh, just felt for him, uh, the entire team did, and uh, was very disappointed for him uh, personally. Um, you know, our leader go down and uh, really, you know, wondered about Jason's career at, at that time. So. As a backup, I feel like the only way you, you can succeed is if you almost expect things to happen. You can't be taken aback, you can't be surprised by something that happens in front of you as a two. Uh, we're fortunate that uh, Nate Hibble was there and a quality quarterback uh, that was able to come in and, and uh, you know, give us life and continue to, you know, continue what Jason had started and, and put us on a, a winning path. For me, it was uh, kind of a once-in-a-lifetime type moment where I got a chance at 
um, quote unquote redemption. Well, was, we got off to a good start. That was my moment, coming back on the field, getting a chance, and we were on fire in the first half. And then uh, I believe we were up maybe 20 to three at halftime. We scored right, right before the end of the first half, and I think we clearly had momentum. And we came back out kind of flat. You know, Coach Stoops always says, he says that, hey, you can never count a team down. You know, you don't, you don't know when. It's, it's four quarters in the game. Uh, I remember the game being awfully hot. It looked like we played a lot of snaps in the second half and kind of wore down. They had a good defense. Um, they were really salty up front, their defensive front. I mean, they were huge. They, they moved the ball and got a score to make it 20 to 10. Then I, uh, they got a, either a fake punt or we, we fumbled a, a kickoff. And all of a sudden, uh, it was 2017. They made a couple special team plays, really got themselves back in the game. Well, I just remember the game, uh, you know, that, that we played really atrociously on some special teams. They had recovered uh, an onside kick, uh, a surprise one that we muffed, uh, a fake field goal uh, on us, and, and just a uh, fake punt, I believe. It just went on and on. So you never know when when uh, when that team's going to come back and have, have some um, things go their way, and you're going to have to overcome some obstacles. Hey, the Sooners were dead. I, had a, I was writing my story in my head. It was one of those, you know, it was like, you know, gulp, you know, we're going to have to go down here and win this football game. I'd made the statement back in the summer that uh, uh, the Alabama game was a gimme for the Sooners. I'd written it off as an OU victory, and now I'm thinking, uh, you know, anybody, I hope nobody remembers me saying that, and I'm going to have to account for this somehow. This game's over. We didn't, I don't think sitting at home in Norman, um, we, we expected to be in that situation. I felt like, especially how the first half had gone, we felt like we had it in hand. I'm thinking somebody needs to make a play. And they needed something, they needed the big play, they needed a spark in the game. Of course, you kept on keeping Alabama around and they think, hey, we can win this game. I figured somebody would, I just didn't know who it would be. But I do remember uh, late in that game, everybody was kind of scurrying down to the sideline. And I remember standing up in the press box because I just sensed something good was going to happen. We kept hanging on, kept coming back. And, and in the fourth quarter, I, I, it just evolved that way where we had a, a shovel pass on. I didn't see it coming. And the thing about Ronaldo works, I didn't see it coming before, and I never saw it again. Truthfully, I had, I had no idea. I probably. That probably would have been my last thought. I, I remember being, you know, in some situations you may not be as confident as others, but I, I don't know, something, uh, I, there was a calm about me, which uh, so a lot of times I'm not a very calm person and, and just felt a, uh, I think our team just a calmness. I, I was really focused as a quarterback. I mean, these guys are staring at you, you know. I, I was really focused on the task at hand. When they told me it's a shovel pass and it's coming to me, I knew immediately that I'd be getting the ball. I, I think everyone had great confidence. Uh, I don't know what it was. Just something about that we, we just thought we were going to come back and win the game. And the huddle was like, everybody was just saying, hey, let's go make a play. Somebody needs to step up and make a play. I was really in the moment and after the First run, I remember the crowd jumping up in the air. And uh, and it began to happen. It began began to kind of crystallize that this Sooner Magic, is this kind of gonna be one of those deals here against Alabama? And you know, could this be it? Sooner Magic's supposed to be happening years ago, but could it be happening here? One particular third down that I hit Antoine Savage on, like this little skinny slant post type route, was uh, pretty, uh, strange how it came about because the play call at the time it was called uh, the basic route was called 98. Coach Long I got this play from um, the St. Louis Rams. This is a play that I didn't actually have a whole lot of confidence in because I had thrown it for an interception in uh, like one of these fall scrimmages. You know our whole crowd's up everybody's in anticipation and coach calls this play and we haven't run it ever. Antoine Savage runs it just like Coach Long draws it up. I throw it in there. He makes a very good catch. First down. Just how he how he stretched out and made the play. For me right there, that was a huge confidence builder. We ended up calling that play all year long. He felt like he wasn't going to be denied, you know. If, he, if, we, you know, if we don't get that, uh, we're looking at fourth and six, seven, eight yards.
Well, I remember it was called 26 Shovel. I was really called at the right time, caught them uh, by surprise, and uh, Ronaldo works, uh, gets the shovel pass, and just makes an incredible run, uh, making people miss him, getting down the boundary. Obviously, I want the ball in Ronaldo's hands, not my hands, because he's going to run up field. When I received the ball, I just went all out and ran as hard as I could. And, and just a sensational play on Ronaldo's part, and, and a well-timed play by the, by the uh, offensive coach's call. Ronaldo just made just a phenomenal uh, individual effort. Ronaldo works. Uh, you know, something burned in his belly when they gave him the ball. Nate Hibble threw him those, those uh, shovel passes. All of a sudden, here comes that magic, that will, that well, I'm going to do it, and he just looked like uh, Jimmy Brown or somebody. I just, I wanted us to win. I wanted, I wanted us to win so bad. I, I think when they made the plays, I think Oklahoma diffused the confidence in Alabama. We're coming from behind. We're about to win this game. People knew it. You know, it's, maybe it is that, you know, sooner magic. I mean, people felt it. We went down there and executed uh, uh, very well throughout that whole drive and, and took very little time in going down and regaining the lead. That inside shuffle pass uh, became a staple of OU's offense. Pure jubilee, you know, in the, in the end zone when, you know, we had been taught, and you wouldn't think you'd have to teach guys to celebrate. Coach Long was always, you know, it's hard to get in that end zone, boys. You know, when you get there, enjoy it. So we ran in there. You know, I remember all 11 of us in the stands are going crazy. My feeling was the fans in the stands, my perception of the mood was that fans, it had been a long time since there had been a game like that, a big game. Uh, you know, it maybe go back to the 80s since it had really been a, a game where oh, you needed magic to win. In that moment right there, that's as, that's as rowdy as I can ever remember our crowd being. Because of his running skills, uh, uh, he set the stage for Oklahoma to pull out a, a very tight game. For one five, six minute period, not football minutes, real minutes, for five minutes, Ronaldo works with Superman. I feel like I'm a football player. You're supposed to make plays. I remember that I knew we were going to have to stop him one more time. Was that, you know, it was always your reaction as a defensive coach. You're always telling him to use a lot of the clock because uh, uh, we, we were going to have to go out there and stop him one more time. I remember how tired I was at, at the end of the two plays. <laughs> okay, I think we had one of our patented zone blitzes on at the time, and uh, we came up with a huge turnover, and, and Eric did pick it up, and that's the last thing I remember about the game. It was like the ghosts of, you know, the stadium just like <laughs> made the guy fumble the ball. We played all four quarters and we came out with a victory. You know, you, you look back at uh, when we talked about my history, my coaching career, it took a Joe Washington type play. He was able to make a play that you really don't realize that early in the season how significant it will mean the rest of the year. We were, we, we, you know, obviously we were very happy that was early in the season to win a big game like that. Was, we were meant to win the football game. There are no ifs, ands, and buts. We were meant to win it. You know, play after play after play, a bounce here. It just seemed to be predestined that it was going to work out that way. Uh, and I felt sorry for my good friend Coach Fran, but I didn't feel that sorry for it. It took a little while to, to sink in on what exact, how big it was. I'm not sure we look back and appreciate how magical that was. And that game was just great for college football, it really was. Because that was magical. Ronaldo works was magical. Well, I think Ronaldo had many uh, defining moments as a Sooner. Uh, he had an excellent career here and, and uh, made a lot of big plays through the years. So. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I could label it as, as one defining moment, but it was one of them, um, you know, in a, in a very special play and, in, and an important play. I think everybody in the locker room afterwards was so just gassed from the amount of emotion that was spent. I did go to the locker room after the game and, and see him, and he was crestfallen. I mean, uh, you know, he just felt that his club had it, uh, you know, that it, that game was done. It was, they had pulled off the big upset, and then at the end, it got away. Well, it just shows that players had a had a sense of you know uh, of purpose and, and the ability to make plays when they had to make them. And and uh, Ronaldo and Kiwan with the touchdown, uh, their play are lined up in front of them again to, to you know to put themselves in that position. And, and then the defense to, to come out uh, the very next series and stop them. And 
and uh, of course they help us with the fumble, but, but still we're in position to make the play and, and Eric Bassey's touchdown, you know, uh, more than sealed the victory and, and uh, you know, you feel fortunate in those situations when you, you know, when you come from behind like that and, and win a game. For me, that was a pivotal moment in my growth as a, a college player, a football player, and maybe a human being. Ronaldo Works will go down uh, as one of the, the great individual players in terms of making big plays in, in OU history. It just so happened that I got the opportunity to step up and make a play. And that's why I say that's, that's when some of the magic comes in. And that was, that was an awesome feel. I mean, I remember the feeling of the play shake. It was, it was amazing. While Oklahoma clearly was a superior talent, Alabama played their hearts out that day. And to have us uh, having a series together for a couple of years was very exciting, uh, exciting, and, and the games uh, lived up to it. They were, they were uh, great games. And uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful day. I remember um, a sportscaster came up to me. I don't know who he was, but uh, he said, years down the line when I get older, he said, you'll realize what you did. And he'll be one of those guys when he's walking around at uh, 60 and 70 years of age that people will say, hey, that's Ronaldo Works, Daddy. Didn't you tell me that he was a key player in that Alabama win? Well, I think, uh, you know, special players making special plays is what it is, but, uh, but that also is Sooner Magic, and uh, uh, they have a way of, of creating their own magic, and, and when you can make special plays in those kind of situations, uh, call it what you want, it's, uh, it, it's all good. All the game winning plays, to me, are Sooner Magic plays. You know, if you can help save, save, uh, save your team from losing, that's Sooner Magic.